Matt, 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 I know you're always ready. So this is this is great. This is great. We got a lot of people still showing up. Um, we've got um, everybody just so you're aware, right? I'm excited to bring Matt Lee to this conversation. This is part of our MSP Blast Off series. One thing you're going to note this time, I'm not doing PowerPoint slides. We're not showing anything like that because we could overwhelm you with that. It's not necessary. So um, while people are still joining in, I see a lot of people kind of starting in. Um, Matt, why don't you give us a little bit of a background, right, of who you are, why you're here, why I'm so excited to talk with you, because as you know, you and I have done a couple things together, especially around security, but I love your background. It's something that everybody can learn from. So tell us about yourself. Yeah, so my mom and dad met in early 80, no, in T's. Um, yes, yeah, so, no. That reminds, uh, I, 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 that reminds me of the right? goodies. You want to start from the beginning? Really? You want to start from the beginning? Okay, well, <laughs> no, it's awesome. My buddy Chunk. No, uh, yeah, so I, I actually started in finance early in my career and jumped every three to four years. I would just get bored, right? I, I had my Series 766LHVA. I did all those things and I and bought and sold diamonds, numismatic, non-numismatic gold. I, I just did a lot of different stuff um, and ultimately landed in technology accidentally. When I did, I started a small break fix MSP and this MSP actually had an integration division too. It was one person at that time. But uh, anyways, and so I started at this small as number seven uh, employee there um, and really quickly realized I wanted to own an MSP. And my, my boss and, and CEO at the time said, sure. I'll let you put your money where your mouth is instead of you leaving. Why don't you buy this share of an owner that's leaving? Uh, and I did. And so I, I bought that. We grew it from under a million in revenue to three and five million and then grew that to six and then merged to be 28. And then uh, it's just a stock swap and then grew that to about 40 million in revenue. And throughout that time, I wore every hat. Like I was literally wrench turner number seven uh, to project manager, to VCIO, to, VC, to, to VCISO, to, uh, which wasn't called that at the time, right? It was really just VCIO was security focus. And then, yeah. uh, and then director of technology, director of security. And at one point, I'm not kidding, JB, like I had a little sticky note on the bottom of my badge that said, and security. Like I just had written and security on the bottom of my badge because I didn't want to reorder a badge <laughs> for my name badge. Um, that said, though, you know, our AV division or we called it AV division, but integration division grew to do a lot of that commercial integration stuff. And I would often come in and go, holy crap, this is the security you all have to work with with your vendors. And they tell you that's the only way to function like um, and a lot of those challenges. Right. So I lived in both sides of that world as a technician and also as a business leader. Um, we then grew that and exited successfully for uh, 14 times EBITDA uh, and and ultimately at a very high revenue number and EBITDA number. So it was a good day. I got chips off the table. But during that time, I got punched in the face really hard. Believe it or not, JB, even though my eyes point in two different directions, they used to be straight. Uh, and then I got punched in the face by a cyber actor. <laughs> we'll do that to you, right? <laughs> it does. It happens. And the gray comes from it, right? Uh, so anyway, short story long, um, we, we, got, um, we bought a company I can now call Voldemort. Uh, and Voldemort is because I'll never say their real name again, but that MSP was compromised by Soto no Kibi ransomware gang for the third time, as it turns out. Um, and every client sued us and left, every employee quit. Uh, we did end up getting one of those clients back a couple of years later, but you think of the lost revenue, the investment in a million dollar company that is wasted, the insurance claim of a million that was basically not paid. We got, I think, 280,000 in the total claim. So you have this like total actual economic impact of about $3 million. Um, and so I, I vowed right then that things were broken, that we we didn't have good due diligence, due care, I, I get into all of it, but ultimately it allowed me um, to to build a very, very, very secure, very scalable uh, managed service provider that we ultimately sold. Uh, and then I now just educate and work in subject matter and work in uh, volunteer and different things in that regard. But PAX8, uh, like I said, likes to sponsor my breakfast, lunches, and dinners. And also, fun fact, JB, I'm getting my t-shirts from PAX8 made with like a two inch offset for the logos, just so the oh. beard doesn't cover up the logos, right? Yeah, so yeah. I'm I know, that. well, your beard is gonna continue to grow. I know, yeah, I, I think it's coming back. It's coming since back. I met you, you know, so. Yeah. <laughs> uh, that's awesome. Um, your you are such a great story for our audience from a Domo's perspective because I, I mentioned to you, right, while we focus a lot on managed service providers, and, we also yeah. focus a lot on this integration side, right? Which And we they, used you on the integration side, right? Like we we were a Domo's buyer, like 
years and years ago yeah. when it was a, an early thing. So yeah, yeah, I'm with you. But yeah, sorry. Yeah, you, you, you know what you know what we need to do. But you know this this talk, right? This MSP blast off series to me is about thought leadership and the title that we've given um, this particular blast off episode is really around elevating your security, taking a proactive approach. And when our marketing team and I were talking about, I could think of nobody better than you to speak to this because one, you've been there, you've done that, but all of the things that you do in the community now really talk about how we as individuals, right? We as MSPs, we as integrators, we as vendors, right? I'm going to throw us into the bucket too. Yeah, man, you should. Do a better job, right? So, yeah. I mean, I appreciate what you're doing and I'm glad that you're here today. So, thank you very much. And yeah, man, this, thank you. This leads to a poll question. I want to get a little bit of interactivity going with uh, with our audience here. So, I'm going to throw this poll up here, right? It is this, right? Tell us how, oh, let's launch the poll rather than me just talking about it, right? <laughs> but tell us how overwhelmed you are with this topic of security, right? Tell us what it means for you because what I ultimately want to understand from you guys is what does security mean to you, right? You as a listener, <laughs> I'm right now. I so. just read question four, so that's fun. Nobody came to see me. <laughs> <laughs> yes, they did, Matt. Yes, they did. I have <laughs> So let's see, we're getting responses, we're getting responses. So Matt, while people are responding, right? Tell, yeah. tell me what your thought is about security right now. I mean, I think I have a known, right? Yeah. Understanding of what you'll say, but tell me what you think about this. You know, I, I, you know me, I'm one to tell a story. So I, I'll say, do you know when the car was invented? It was invented in 1897, ultimately. It's the internal combustion engine car. Um, we didn't have a seatbelt put on patent until 1950, right? We didn't have any laws really to say around cars and automobiles or so other than, you know, interstate challenges, maybe, you know, speed limits, things like that. But we didn't have any real laws around cars and how they were manufactured until Ralph Nader comes up in 1965 and writes a book called Unsafe at Any Speed around the Corvair, right? And, and then in 1966, we finally have the National Motor Vehicle Safety Act. We're in that same phase of technology. We had the digital computer in 1937, right? We had internet in 1981. We didn't have you know, anything in place until 2018, 2020 around a national cybersecurity uh, strategy. So like yeah. we all need to be better. And then the other challenge of security, JB, is like there's this Dunnings-Kruger challenge. If you're not familiar with it, go look up this somewhat now debunked Dunnings-Kruger principle. But basically saying that like the more you know about some real complex situa uh, conversations, you start realizing how much you really don't know about it and you have this like pit of despair of like, oh my God, there's so much more. And I think depending on where you were on that curve and how much you care right now um, in this early stages, you might not care and go like, yeah, everything's good, right? Or you might be, and which is more likely in that stage of, I think I've got security under control until you like fall over the front end and go, wait a minute, there's like 52% more policy I need and tons more things I'm not thinking about. And um, and yep. so you just, just that's where we're at in my mind. Um, and the, and the data represents that, but. I actually completely agree with with that curve, right? Um, you know, in the business world, it's really the Gartner hype cycle, right? Product yeah, management, sure. right? right? Sure. It, because it's about, wow, this is a great new thing. I'm excited about this, or I'm completely scared about it, so I got to learn about it. And then you get kind of this uh, uh, marketing people might want to edit this, but this oh shit moment <laughs> where where you're like, this is way too overwhelming. And in fact, if you look at the results of this poll, Matt, I don't know if you you saw those while you were talking, but you know. Essentially, one third, right, 39%, right, basically said, in my mind, well, you know, if I had all the answers, I wouldn't be here, right? People are trying yeah. to still get an education around this this topic of security. They're trying yeah. to figure out what they do with it, right? They realize it's a problem, right? To your point, and, they have stories. And to be fair, they're trying to fight through the freaking Hart Gartner hype cycle. Like yeah. if I'm really if I'm really honest, it's really just through a wall of marketing crap. And I yeah. think that's the challenge for a lot of practitioners that we're seeing is like you go see this stops all threats stated somewhere, which really just makes people stupid. I, I just want to say the Billy Madison answer of like, may God have mercy on your soul. I award you no points. Right. Like um, a simple no would have sufficed. But the point is, like, is, is we're seeing that effect wear off and we're seeing yeah. people get smarter and mature. 
And I think that top three answers being what, 39, 49, 55, 60, 68 percent or so, that's mm -hmm. almost 70%. Now, super hearts out to my 13% out there. I love you too. Yeah, um, yeah. I was, I was going to comment on that. You knew yeah, that was going to You did set the data up though, because they could just be not overwhelmed. And Matt was an ancillary aspect at the end of that. So this this actually could be an untrue data set, if I'm honest, but still either way. Um, <laughs> hey, hey, and I, we and I, I think the numbers you what we need. <laughs> yeah. So my point is everybody's trying to learn. And because of that maturation, and I would say rapid maturation over the last two years, you have seen more pressure on vendors. You have seen more pressure on clients. You have seen more pressure from insurance. You've seen more pressure in a regulatory space. You've seen all of this marketing. Like, like it used to be you could have a dude that would roll up with like a really raggedy looking mule and a cart with like thousands of pill jars in there. And he's like, oh, bro, I've got your fix. And then they like had the FDA and the Food and Drug Act. And they said, no, wait a minute. Or the Safe Food and Drug Act, whatever it is. Don't, don't kill me on this. <laughs> but ultimately, and now Carter can't just have pills, right? They have to mean something. They have to be labeled. They have to say not necessarily evaluated by the FDA or yeah, they say things like that. We're not even at that stage yet, right? We're still in the yeah. cart phase of our life we're still in the ragged mule phase of our life in, in technology so it's, yeah it's interesting right because i mean this notion of snake oils right everybody's selling yeah, out they're selling their their value propositions about how they satisfy security and what this means and that just makes it even more complex now yes this gets this gets to my next topic actually which are and i i've been a proponent of this right security frameworks right yeah. i think I think the notion of a framework is a beautiful thing because it kind of sets, gosh, I hate to say boundaries because you and I have talked standard. about- That's a standard. It set the guidepost, it right? Did. Uh, it did, right? Yeah. It said, here's the field you're playing in, right? Here's, yeah. here's, here's some of the rules, call it the regulations of things that we think you should, uh, the bounds, right, that you should work within in order to help yeah. your security posture get better. <laughs> One thing you have always said to me, and I, I preach this whenever I say it, it's not a one and done thing. It's a process, no, it's a journey. right? Yeah, yeah. It's a, it's a, it's ever evolving journey, and it's because the landscape's changing, and 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 the the threats are changing, uh, the threat actors are changing, and you know the te the techniques and the vulnerabilities are changing, and so it's it has to be a growing element and, and an absolute part. But talk about frameworks. So I want to talk about the why. Let me give you the TLDR if you're listening, so I don't lose of the 97 people or so talking. I'm gonna, yet, but... I'm gonna launch another poll while yeah, you're I'll just doing... chat the background. Imagine me moving my hands around all passionately. That's all you have to say. <laughs> okay. So you know when you think about a framework, what it does is it gives you defensibility. What is defensibility? Defensibility is simply put meeting the reasonable person test or the reasonable man rule uh, as it's laid out, which says if I put a bunch of people in a box and I told them here's the pieces you can use and here's the thing you have to solve, would they find my choices of how to put the pieces together and move forward reasonable? That's it. That's what it comes down to at its simplest, you know, summarized form. <clears throat> and so when you think about defensibility, is it more reasonable to say the reason I'm buying Sentinel One or 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 Threat Down or Domoats or whatever it may be is because it's that new hotness, man? And I heard my buddy over there tell me I need to buy it, and everybody else was doing it. And man, I went to this conference, people said it. Or is it more defensible to say, um, actually, we um, we use that because 10.1 ascribes in CIS that we need you know, anti-malware capabilities. We realize that includes anti-malware at the network, at the device layer. And so for the device layer portion of that, for what we can install on, we're using Sentinel-1. We further chose it because 10.2 goes into auto update aspects, 10.3 then goes into centralization, 10.4 goes, whatever it may be. And the argument goes to say, which one sounds more reasonable? And then you ask yourself, why does it matter? Ohio passed a law that came to this understanding of safe harbor around cyber incidents, of setting a limitation of liabilities and a limitation of, of those losses based on meeting reasonability and went on to ascribe, hey, using frameworks helps you solve that. So there's a lot of reasons, but at the very boiled down, a framework is stove is hot, don't touch stove, right? Yeah. And, and so it, it, it's generally just that. <laughs> yeah, go ahead, sorry. Yeah, no, no, so I've got those results showing and you, you can yeah. also see those, I'll hide those now. But fundamentally, I think I, I really see kind of two camps here, right? The one camp being, and, and I'm actually surprised to see this, that people are actively working to improve their, secu their client security posture. I think that's a wonderful statement, a wonderful goal. I think a lot of people are trying to figure out how they do that. Um, yeah, I agree. But I also, I also am not surprised by the fact that people know that frameworks, they're probably thinking about regulations are coming and they're trying to figure out how they get ready for it, right? Yeah, and what's interesting is like, imagine you're playing football and I can say American football because I'm not in Canada or Australia right now, 
but let's imagine you're playing you're playing football um you don't go out there and immediately line up 11 people and play a, a play in 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 sixth, fifth grade right yeah. when you play what do you do jb you, you jump in and you train well, you first of all, like when you're on the yard, you're, you're you're picking the biggest guys, and you're picking right. You're picking True the story. team. Right? True story. But I mean, if you're prepping a real team, like yeah. you have to go run first. You have to go get um, stretched. You have to do calisthenics. You then need to teach how to how to actually block, how to engage someone. Where do I wrap up? How do I tackle? Literally, the blocking and tackling, right? You like also need to know the yeah. rules, right? You have to know the rules. Yeah, hundred percent, right. exactly. Yeah, and, and and so when you think about that, we we simply have an iterative and basics challenge and that is not being met like do any of you listening right now have a list of all of your own assets like what is an asset an asset's not just your workstation or or your server it's your switches it's your network devices it's your your iot devices it's your and how do i know that because i'm following a framework 1.1 ascribes all of those things right that we're talking about mobile devices all of those are considered assets and so if I asked you again, how many of you have in your own heart, have a list of your own assets, the answer cannot be 100%. I wasn't at 100%. I still have problems with that. It's always a challenge. Yeah. Um, and so following a framework gives you defensibility, but it also gives you a guidebook to say, okay, 1.1 says I have my list of my assets. Oh God, that's what an asset? Anything that store process data? Maybe as I go through three and four and those other controls and two, I control what an asset can be, what can access my data. And now I have less in my asset list. It's it's really this interconnected interwoven thing, but ultimately I'm glad so many people have said they are working to improve. And I think the 11% that have implemented one for themselves, I, um, I'm extremely enlightened because the question was there. And I'm hoping they really are looking at and built a NIST or NIS or ACSC or NCSC or whatever framework they're going to use um, for themselves uh, by that answer. So frameworks are frameworks are so dependent on what it is you're doing, who you are, right? Who you want to be, where you are, to, right? Um, where you are. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. I mean, whether you're in Europe or Australia or Canada, New York versus California, even right? NYDFS, oh, California, yeah. privacy problem. Oh, yeah, all those things. Yeah. California is providing a, a lot of challenges now, right? I would say they're just yeah. as strict as uh, GDPR in Europe uh, for some sense. I think that... Uh, and, and in some ways more scalable because I can sue you for it, right? Not necessarily <laughs> your government, yeah. right? I can say you violated my rights in this regard. So there's some yeah. interesting components there. Yeah. So um, you mentioned something about like knowing assets, right? I think a lot of people... I was talking to, um, I was talking to Nika, one of our account executives, um, about about this webinar we were doing and one of the things that he pointed out when i said you know when you talk to our customers what do you see as security what do they see as security and you know he he made a an interesting point as you know sometimes people really just want to understand you know what pam and finance is doing right we think that right. just know what pam is doing is enough um you know how is she utilizing the computer i'm not convinced that that's always the case, right? Security, you know, you said assets, understanding what assets are on the network, understanding how those assets are being utilized throughout the network, or yeah. where they are in the network are, are parts of it. Um, what, what's your thoughts on, on that, Matt? I mean, how do we, what, this element of what security means, right? And how do we yeah. use these security frameworks is really where I'm getting here. Well, what is security, right? So what, what matters? What, what is it? What, what is security? Why does it matter? That's the first thing. Let's define that. Let's make sure people understand that. Yeah. Security is about data. When we talk about cybersecurity specifically or information security, we're talking about data. Security is about data. Why, why do I care about data? Well, I might need my patient information to do work and bill for insurance. I might have things to track their health records. I might need information about you as a buyer of an automobile at my car lot or how the financing was done. I might need, that's all, that's all data. That's all data. All that stuff is data. So if we yeah. understand that data is what we're talking about as a central point, wherever it may lie, wherever it may lie, right? We understand there's data. The cloud, on-prem, right? It doesn't matter. Right, yeah, I don't care. Your flash drive you left in the parking lot, whatever it might be. Um, and so if you have data- I told you not to bring up my flash drive in the parking lot. My, now you my bad, man. I said I wasn't gonna dox you and then I did it. That's on me, bro, that's on me. But it's all about data. And when it comes to data, it's about the CIA triad. So I don't have a way to ask a poll, but I would, I would just hope that you are all familiar with the CIA triad. Um, it means the confidentiality, integrity, and availability. Confidentiality says, you know, if I have a file that's super secret scroll with J.B. Fowler, 
does is that JB opening that file or me? That's it. That's the two people that should open super secret squirrel file, right? And so when you talk about uh, integrity, integrity is is that file been modified? Did somebody else change it? So I think JB said, and that could be a confidentiality and integrity challenge. But imagine somebody stealing from you in QuickBooks and they're modifying the data to say that they changed uh, the drawer had this change instead of this, or I only paid this much for this item versus that. That's an integrity challenge. And then availability challenge is, is can I use it? Is it there? And we as MSPs have focused really good on availability. Even in the integrator world, we're like, yeah, we have this control for adaption, but we have another one in case we need failover. We have this way to figure, like there's re yeah. resiliency and, and availability. Yeah, High yeah. availability framework, yeah, you're right. But cybersecurity really, really falls in my mind in some of the A, but a lot of C and I, right? Confidentiality and integrity. And so backup helps meet the I and A, but security then when you do this, you know, Venn diagram is, is left with essentially the confidentiality is the biggest thing to really deal with there specifically. So it's all about identity and should should you have access to that data. So when you get to it, the first five say, uh, controls in CIS, uh, critical internet, uh, Center for Internet Security critical controls are know your assets, know your data, right? Or know your assets, software and, 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 and then, or physical then software, software one, two. Yep. know your data, configure things the way you need them, like limit, you know, maybe RDP doesn't need to be on. Maybe LLMNR shouldn't be turned on your Active Directory controller. Ask me how I know, right? I would destroy you. <laughs> right? So, um, you know, and, and you get into control four. Then control five is all about identity. It's it's how do I give JB JB? How do I make sure JB has the right things? How do I give him access? How do I centralize authentication? So instead of JB having one JB and thousands of passwords somewhere, he has one pure JB right in 5.6 with single sign on. Um, and then you, you get into control six that gets into authorization. But my point is those first early controls set the stages of what I genuinely believe is real cybersecurity. You gotta know where your data is so you can protect it. You gotta know what veins it's flowing through, what software it's being used. You gotta know yeah. what assets it's working on. Uh, anyways, maybe I've gone tangential to your question. No, but... no, no, you haven't, you haven't. That's a critical part, which because one of the things that we at Domotes um, from early on focused on was, um, access to your systems, right? One sure. of the things that we realized was so critical is implementing things like two-factor authentication so that the identity could be, let's say, protected, right? That yeah. you knew who was getting into the system. With That's a, like 5.3, 5.4, 5.5 would be all your RDP, remote, or all your MFA usual uh, yes. safeguards. Right? So, I mean, taking yeah. advantage of SAML, right? Or some sort of identity provider to go in there. That's 5.6. Sorry, I'm just broken, bro. I, I can only speak in safeguards. Top of your head is amazing to me. <laughs> <laughs> I live in them. It's my whole world. You do, you do indeed. Uh, yeah. you do indeed. Uh, so well, maybe. this gets. Let me let me get this question out there on the poll. I, I hope you guys. And I was wrong. Those are six dot three through five. So anybody oh, wants to well, me, you can do that now. I was totally. Don't tell wrong. anybody. I'm sure there are a lot of people that are like thinking, "Oh, I can't believe that guy." Loser. Kind of wrong. This loser. Yeah, I will okay. say, I will say the fact that uh, the CIS control frameworks, you know, there's 18 different controls on version eight. There's how many hundreds of safeguards, right? 153. Uh, yeah, yeah, there's 153. Exactly. Safeguards. I mean, it, it's quite overwhelming, quite frankly. And I, and I think that if you break it into its smaller components, there's thousands of taxonomical aspects that are being covered oh, right, yeah, in yeah. those hundred. I mean, when you get into like, well, what implementation group am I? How do I manage this, right? And and all that. And, and that actually brings up why I brought up this poll, because it was perfect, perfect timing, right? Uh, in my I'm mind, sure. for you as a service provider, right, whether you're in the managed service provider space or the IT department space or the integration space, okay? Yeah. You need to be thinking about security frameworks. So this question, I think, is really relevant, which is, you know, what are you doing with respect to security frameworks? How are you implementing it, right? What's your biggest challenge? with that. And I do think that some people are going to say nobody's asking for it, right? And therefore I love the stats coming in. Yeah, you got about a quarter of them right now that are saying nobody's asking for it. And Yeah, this is interesting, right? This is of all of let, me, let me go I ahead. I agree and with this. you. I you agree sure. with you if you have said I don't have the resources. I agree with you even if you said nobody's asking for it because nobody calls in and goes, "Yes, I would really like my car safety testing ATSM to be above the 4.2 minimum measured based on crash safety." Like nobody nobody give they don't. They want a safe product. They want to feel like yeah. they're secure. That's what they want. So I don't blame any of the, anybody with those answers. I don't blame anybody, but no, I don't no, disagree no. with any of those answers. That this, said, yeah, go ahead. 
No, I was going to say this in my mind, I, I'm not surprised by these results right now that I, I look at it a little bit more. I mean, first of all, people are just overwhelmed. So therefore, it's all these things. But I actually am a little bit concerned, Matt, that nobody's really asking for it. Right. And then that's probably going to bring up the question of, well, who should be asking? Who should be driving this? We can talk about. But I'm also a little bit worried about the third result, which is I just don't have the resources to implement no, this. No, I'm not. I'm solving that, I think, to your point. Um, one of the challenges is imagine a world where you're trying to solve 9.5, and you can go look somewhere and click and see that these four products offer 9.5 as capabilities, and it's been validated by somebody, not to a deep efficacy like product one is better than product two and two is better not an efficacy rating like a lab would but just a taxonomical or scientific like there's a stegosaurus why because it has those like weird back thingies and it has that weird tail right and it's about short and has this kind of dimensions right that's what makes the taxonomical components of looking at that without getting into the genome and phylum and all that but the point being taxonomy is a scientific methodology of sorting right what are those components well, if you look at what imagine you're trying to figure out what I should do and you're going through all this marketing hype and things of I solve all threats. What if I could say who does 10.1, 10.2, 10.3, 9.5, 4.2, 4, the cheapest. And I could look at those in that way. And, and you could get into some interesting worlds where it's about educating and empowering. So I think the gap is the vendors themselves, and I know this firsthand, have not had the knowledge internally of frameworks in general, CIS specifically, but of, of how they even apply to that, how, what their tools do. They know what they've sold. They know what they've built into. They know what Gartner puts them in, but they don't understand what a practitioner in a tactical world is going to use and which sword he's going to grab and which rifle she's going to grab. It, they, don't, they don't get into that. They don't understand those pieces of it to a safeguard level. And so I've spent the last two years doing this myself with vendors, but now I've got a 48 person working group that is building out a mapping that vendors can put themselves in to say, Here's the, the safeguards I help cover, and I'm either partial, full, or facilitating, and then extending that out to other frameworks, this, tra this trans-mappable capabilities through like CIS. Now, at that point, that point that you made is actually one of the reasons that um, you and I kind of met a couple of years ago. I think it was at a sure. conference event, right? We hosted this. Yeah. It, was it just feels like a couple of years ago, but yeah. <laughs> I, I keep the stupid thing on my desk all the time, right? But why yeah, yeah. don't critical to your security? and to your point, right, you and I started talking about this because I created this document and the marketing team beautified it. But, you know, I put down how do we as a solution or vendor solve, right, the different controls, right? What do we do? I agree, I agree with the mappings of the, at the macro level to some of those yeah. capabilities. Yeah, that's fair. Well, I put that on here because I think it helps solve, right, some of these initial questions. But in my mind, and this, in my mind, this is way less about domos and what we as an industry, we as vendors, need to be doing to help, you know, the 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 service providers that are out there do their job yeah. better, right? And I love, I love, and it's one of the reasons that I brought you on here today. I love what you guys are doing here because it's the right motion. Thanks, man. Once that's once that science work is done and we have that mapped and it's not just Pax8, it's going to be industry people, right? Pax8 happens to be paying for it because I'm asking them to. Uh, but for the most part, this is industry led. Um, we're going to extend that out to people like Trustmark. So when you're getting assessed um, for your Trustmark, perhaps, then you can say, yeah, I used uh, whatever product it is. I don't want to keep plugging into one. It's just the one that comes to mind. But and, and they can look at the list and go, yeah, that makes sense. Oh, this other guy wrote down my cousin's truck bumper software. Well, maybe we need to investigate that one because it's not mapped. Right. And so you get into that kind of understanding of where we can make efficiencies of scale by some of this work. Um, John Strand and team are working on an effort to take that work product and then make it better by adding in how it should be configured in addition to how uh, it needs to map taxonomically. Right. Something I'm not tackling, which is how should I set it to make it that way? So once we get the mapping done, which nobody's done. In fact, I, I thought somebody had done it. I reached out to CIS and Phyllis said we tried, but we couldn't get the vendors to participate. We couldn't get the work yeah. done. And, of course. So I said, well, I have, I have that capacity, right? And so what I see, yeah, what I see so many vendors trying to do is solve the problem holistically, right? It's like, okay, I'm going to take, you know, some of these guys are trying to take all 18 controls and just map it to their solution. Well, right? and they're trying to do it to 18, which doesn't get granular enough. The reason CIS is so beautiful and I think is better than NIST, or I like to call CIS for any of y'all nerds that want to throw rocks out me out there like me. Um, I like to call CIS is the how to NIST's what, 
And the reason goes back, you can listen to Jacob Horn's podcast if you want, goes back to the beginning when they were trying to carve 171 out of 153 as a subset. And somebody wanted to be exemplary, like maybe we should tell them what kind of stuff they should do, not just thou shalt accomplish this. Um, and they, they had a splitting of ways of how they saw that. One gentleman yeah. went to Sands and created the top 18, which became the top 20. Um, and the other gentleman stayed at, at NIST. And so you have this eight, eight or top 20 became CIS 18. The 18 is like really prescriptive stuff, whereas NIST is very high level, do this, thou shalt. So this is the how to that what, in the same way CIS is the how to a lot of other frameworks what. Uh, in that regard. So if you map only the 18, you're only mapping to the what. You're not even mapping to the how. You're just guessing, yeah, that, yeah I help with malware yeah. defense. Well, which one? Which one of these of these, you know, seven in 10.1 through X um, do you do? And nobody's done that because they don't want to. It's too much mental work into the actual taxonomy. And that's why we're making this easier. That's the plan. Um, I think that's I think that's so valuable. I mean, you, you're you talking about the what we're doing. We're talking about the how we're doing it. I, I still go back to, I think if you as a service provider get a much better understanding of the why you're doing yeah. it as well, yeah. it's so, so important because it, that also is going to drive your strategic direction, right? It's going to drive the messaging you give to your clients and the importance of that. And I say that, I say that at a vendor level as well yeah. as a service provider level, right? And what that means. <clears throat> so, yeah. There's some um, good questions we can tackle too, if we want to, uh, from there that are, I think, great um, things to talk about from Jason. Great questions. Yeah, yeah, oh, I was Jason's. actually two Jasons. <laughs> you're on the same page as I am because I, I think it's a great point that Jason brings up, which you know he says, doesn't cloud computing by its fundamental nature avoid these CIA rules? I mean, what's no, your it, yeah, avoid them, like violate them? Um, avoid, so yeah. that's a great question. You are now coming to the challenge and the real understanding of. The, the purpose behind CISA, if you're tracking Jen Easterly's uh, discussions around secure by design, secure by default, but really it comes from SRM, Jason. Uh, if you're not familiar, uh, which I'm sure you are, but shared responsibility matrix, which is this understanding that when we enter into these relationships up till now, they've been really one-sided. Like if somebody at like, let's say Schmackspace decides to blow up their exchange servers through ransomware and doesn't have a backup, let's say, I'm making up this fictitious, obviously occurrence that happened last year, but let's just say that happened. Like, I don't have much recourse. Like the the EULA basically says, sorry, bro, that's on you, have a nice day. And you are seeing, I think there's like four mm -hmm. class action lawsuits right now that are playing out against that. Um, and so you actually do see a world where this, this, this wall of vendor protecting themselves from the client um, is 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 changing, and those will be changing over time. And I do think, to your point, uh, Jason, there's some concern of transferring, but there's also this um, benefits you're getting for this trade-off in the shared responsibility of what they're responsible for now, because they're not in your control anymore. What you're responsible for, that's typically in your EULA today. But you will see more and more SRM reliance saying you're responsible for this. And what does that mean? Let's put this in simple terms. Imagine you need your clients to patch. I don't know what you do, Jason, so bear with me. But imagine you need your clients to patch. Great. Okay, cool. Is that you or them? Who's responsible for that? You're like, me patching. What, is it? Well, no, it's shared because you have to send the patch. You have to have the system and the methodology to send the patch and all those things. But they have to have the machine online. They have to agree to a patch window that's conducive to the patch severity things that you need to start dealing with, right? They have to actually say, yes, I'll pay for the updates to this Cisco SmartNet thing, right? So I can actually update. Like there's parts that are shared and we haven't thought that way. Even you as a vendor to your clients as an MSP, probably haven't dug that deeply into really SRMing um, the responsibilities each hold on each side and defining what those are. That's a new, I say newish push in our world around SRMs being a more larger component of this. But I do love the way your brain's thinking on this, right? As the CIA of confidentiality, integrity, and availability. They're actually making A much better because they make my server almost always up, right? We're like 99.999. Yep. 99, 99, 99. So, 99. Um, yeah, 599. Yeah. yeah, the I, the integrity of it, it's actually probably better than I could provide in my own world, other than the fact that you have this new shared partner that has access to it theoretically, right? As we've well, seen. Well, I want to chime in on that. I mean, from when I think of integrity and availability, I mean, to me, the cloud is the best better place. box in my closet absolutely with absolutely. spinning platter discs and I, yeah no doubt and, and yeah. we've been we've been preaching that i mean as a cloud-based service right of course i have a i could imagine why yes yes, yes. Yeah, right yeah, yeah exactly <laughs> but, but you know, reality, I mean, there's things we can do immediately from a cloud perspective that benefits everybody right um in fact 
is this is, would this be a wrong it's a good time? time for a screen yeah screen connect conversation yeah, right? exactly. that I mean, lays into this because, because this, is part of the problem. this is the twice well part of the problem part of the solution in some way like imagine now you're in a software world let's imagine screen connect and it's a great example kaseya also a great example if you look back uh two years ago right um kaseya knew about their event in like april they knew there was a vulnerability the dutch institute for vulnerability disclosure and team reached out and said we know of a vulnerability now obviously they wanted to get paid and all those things but in addition um they uh they didn't they couldn't do anything for the end user until they made a patch, correct? Like they couldn't really do much. You know what they could do for the cloud users in their cloud environment? They put in a WAF rule. They just put in a, a web application framework rule that blocked or a firewall rule that blocked that particular technique. Done. Solved. They're they're protected. Now they need to patch it. Same thing happened with ConnectWise. Everybody's panicking about seeing the version. ConnectWise had protections in place to the cloud hosted stuff even before the version had an update to fix it. Right, because they're able to apply that based on some threat intelligence and apply that at the WAF level, right? Um, in that in that way, in a software install world, you're in a you're in a Sophie's choice, because now I have to communicate to you who could be a threat actor. Threat actors buy these softwares for this purpose. I have to communicate to you that it's your job to upgrade, and I have to tell you why. And as soon as I do, the threat actors now start a clock of, oh my God, it's that simple. Front slash dollar. Oh my God, right? And so you have this world that you can't live in an opsec way with third parties you can't trust and and so there's i don't want to get too much in the weeds on this but there's a real challenge of that ba that balance when it comes to installed software that is not present in the cloud and SaaS world and that is a challenge and it's one i think this industry will have to change you saw connectwise actually give out licenses yesterday I don't know if you saw this, if you have an old Screen Connect version and you don't think you can upgrade, they gave away license and said, we'll let you come to the top version now, which I didn't expect. People are frustrated about that. Oh, look at all those suckers that paid for support. And you're like, what? You have somebody trying not to have the death of millions from a business right. perspective happen, giving away licenses at the detriment to their revenue, and you're going to punch them at a time like this. Okay, well, but this the is, point being, yeah, right? the, the, uh, the vulnerability patching side, 7.1 is huge, but yeah. I mean, people that are people that are uh, kind of behaving that way, I, I think they don't realize the the whole it's not if but when type of statement, right? Yeah. Everybody's going to go through these types of pain points. I do yeah, think how how the vendor, how the service provider, how the end customer, right? All of us as a shared responsibility, how we react to these challenges that come that are coming, right? That's what's important here. Um, and I think I think that that in my mind is. Yeah. Uh, I mean, kudos, right? I haven't been into the intimate details of what's going on with the whole Screen Connect thing, but I do, I do love Jason's availability colon all the crap yeah. in between that neither party controls. True story. But I can move the crap in between, right? Like I can go to Starbucks or my house or the next place, mm -hmm. and if I'm doing it securely, I can make that very available in that regard. Yeah. But touche. I love it, Jason. That's good. Story. So another another point that was brought up here, right? Um, which I, I think we should talk about, Matt, which is in customers right it's part of the reason that i asked the poll questions the way i did right i don't believe in customers really know anything about this topic um i do feel this is this is my gut feeling on this right this is part of where service providers again regardless of which market you're serving whether it's the you know commercial audio video space or the it and managed service provider space I think you have a responsibility to help educate. And this is part yeah. of the areas why I think these types of webinars, these types of uh, discussions around security are so important so that you can raise your awareness and help uh, you know, raise the tide so that we're all doing better. We're all getting yeah. smarter. Definitely your awareness. I am a big, big believer of understanding how the threat actor acts so that you can make better decisions. You said that earlier, right, in some way, whether you knew it or not. Um, and and I think going and learning how to hack is a very va valuable part of how I know how to defend, right? I know how I'm going to attack you. It's much easier to know how I'm going to defend me. And we do this in real life, right? Like think about football again. If I had a coach, a defensive coach that's never seen a game of football, let's just say, but only looked at defense, never looked at how the offense works, um, come out and say, I'm going to stop all yards, all downs this year. Not, we're never going to get past a set of downs this, this year. You would laugh at them so much it would be ridiculous and yet we have msps saying that to their clients we have vendors saying that to their partners to their clients <clears throat> we have those type of things being preposterously said when nobody understands that this is a game of limiting damage even in football i want to not lose four downs but i also want to do it not four times or ten times i also want to lose it to a large amount of loss i have like 
lost limits to try to win the game. That's how the game is played. Same thing with cybersecurity. Your job is to find it faster, respond to it quicker, do things that design elements, limit the damage of it, limit the attack surface, like all of yeah. that. To me, yeah. to me, adaptability, right, is sure. so critical. Being agile, right, understanding you have to you have to be able to look at what the offense is doing so that you can know. Because let's 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 be very clear, right? The offense is always the first step, right? In a football yeah. game, right? Nobody's supposed yeah. to move until that ball is snapped by the center, yeah. right? That's exactly. And so, therefore, your defense, you can have a game plan. Okay, you can have a, a play, right? Either, um, you know, you're going man on man or you're going into yeah. zones, right? But the reality is, is that your team needs to be able to adapt to whatever's coming, right? Yeah. Because you don't know whether they're going to punt it, kick it, do a fake play, right? Whatever it may be, right? Throw it, yeah. run with it. That's where having adaptability is so important and security yeah. is the exact same way. And more games are won after that halftime locker room change of game than than yeah. than any other thing, right? That coach going back to the locker room going, all right, what in the heck have they been doing to us? Let's get the film up real quick. Let's do our analysis rundown. Let's make changes. And cybersecurity is the same way. Um, yeah, so anyways. 35% yeah, of out. the people out there were bored with the Super Bowl this year, right, for the first half, right? Yeah. It was the second half that really came out. And you can tell things have changed. Right. Yeah, no doubt. Yeah. True story. That was a slam. That's a great example. There was a comment in by Jason Hines, and I, I don't want to be uh, inflammatory in this statement. And I'm glad to get into like a six, seven hour conversation with you later about this. But the cloud is a the cloud is a larger attack vector than hosting things. Let's start by using words that that we understand. Just make sure we're understanding them. There is protect surface and attack surface. Protect surface is what do I have to protect? That's everything. Everything I own, I must protect in some form or fashion. Mm -hmm. Attack surface is what I choose to expose to the world. And what Jason is correctly saying is cloud, in theory, is significantly more exposed to the world. That's one point of it. I'm not trying to say I'm summarizing all the things you're thinking, right? Cloud is more exposed to the world, and therefore cloud is a larger attack vector in, in hosting things yourself, which I, I'd argue in a lot of ways, like even just in the, the differences of what I can put in between myself and how much I'll spend and maybe those things that start to bring it closer to a normalized number. Like if I have a million dollars and I'm doing a data center and I'm spending that a month on the data center redundancy, power, multiple data centers, capabilities around those things, and then also security functions that scale and can go across it, right? The right WAFs, the right, the right firewalls, the right things inside, the right network segmentation, all those things. So, I, you know, that saying, as long as you're spending that money to equate those things, right, then there have been several occasions where my cell phone service wasn't affected because it wasn't using cloud services, right? And so you, you can come up with those on, on both sides. Um, and in some ways, you're right. Like if I just had an on-prem directory and nobody was targeting me compared to some large vulnerability in something in AD or whatever that might be, then you're 100% right, Jason. But mm -hmm. I think in the predominance for SMB, they are not going to do the thing I said former and therefore makes that latter incorrect. They're not going to spend the money. You're not going to have the HA. So you, even if when you get into the A side of availability, you're not going to get into the redundancy, the physical security measures, the things that you um, actually can track from a governance perspective that you would find in a data center. You won't be able to do most of those things in the same scale. SMB won't do that. But for 20 bucks a license, I have this. And so you get into a very different world of what's more scalable in my argument. But I do love that we're thinking about and bantering on these conversations. And as long as you can justify the decisions you're making and you have reasonable statements, that's all it takes. We don't have to have the same opinion. It just Medica, takes being reasonable and looking at these things. Yeah. It goes back to process, right? Yep. I mean, why are you implementing process, procedure and policy? Yeah. You are, right? Why are you utilizing the solutions that you're using? Is yeah. it is it enough? Right. It may be enough for you, but I, I would. How go much back. is the risk is another part of that that comes into is it enough? Right. If I just have ice cream recipes that are public, then maybe I don't. It doesn't matter. Like some of these ways. I, ben uh, and Jerry's would probably disagree with you. Right. Now so, they would have a difference of opinion because they don't have public recipes. Right. To your yeah. point. And they have <laughs> uh, and Chunky Monkey. <laughs> I love the Chunky Monkey. Um, <laughs> The, uh, I don't know if I should have said that public. Maybe I shouldn't have said that. It's okay. But it, was, it was a little nice. It was nice. <laughs> so everybody's concerned about, you know, breach avoidance, right? Threat mitigation. What's your take on compliance, right? What does it, what does it mean to be compliant? And I'm, I'm going to ask oh, that generically so that you kind of sure. riff on that or ask me other questions. Fair. Um, so think of it this way. I can be very compliant. What does it mean to be compliant to something? Um, if I need to make my bed in, in the morning, 
am I compliant? What's the determination of compliant, JB? If I made my bed or not, right? What's the determination of am I compliant with that policy? Yeah, whether whether I how my my either my parents if I'm a child or how my wife reacts to it, right? Whether yeah, I made yeah. the bed, right? Yeah, yeah, and they're gonna validate and check. So compliance is did I make my bed because the rules said to make my bed? That's it. That's what compliance really is. The rules can suck. I can yeah. have crappy rules. I can be very compliant to a very crappy policy. Right. Like I could have a policy that says use three character passwords and have that be one with an exclamation point. Like, OK, great. I now have two to guess through to take me all of a so, femto second. So we right? talk but, about yeah. HIPAA in the U.S. Sure. We talk about PCI, right, payment card yep. transactions. Those are right? types of compliances. Those sure. are types of compliance. The thing that kind of bothers me about this and the reason I wanted to bring this subject up is I can follow all the rules. I can make my bed. Yeah. But it doesn't necessarily mean that I'm not going to have a breach, right? That I'm not right. going to have some sort of threat. Does it mitigate some level of threat? Absolutely. Right. But that's a good good call out. How the, do I how do I handle this? Right. What's the thought around this? Well, if you look at NIST, at least before the new NIST 2.0 with governance added in, there are five components of NIST. There is identify, know thyself, right? Know the stuff I have, know what data I have. Those things, the first three safeguards really. There's there's protect. Right. You're getting into now actually applying protections, applying, you know, things to defend against right back to your making your bed. But then there's detect, respond and recover. Why are there three fifths after the boom and only two fifths before? It's because there's just as much work to do to reduce the impact after it goes boom, like how fast I find it. Right. How well I respond. Yeah. And I'll give you a great example. Some people in the ConnectWise situation have had their users.xml file replaced, which shows indication of the compromise of that vulnerability. And yet they've been told just replace the user XML and you're fine. Depending on what they did after they got in, right. those may not be true. And so yeah. you get into this, this understanding. So it's all about how well you detect, how deeply you detect, how well thou responds, like how quickly can I respond and, and contain and then eradicate? And then how well I recover? How quick can I get back to business? Did I have redundant systems? Did I have redundant hardware? Did I have capabilities of running in a vacuum? What did I do to set myself up for success? And so when yeah. you think about cyber, there's three fifths after the explosion, yet we live like it's only a two fifths world. Um, yeah. and, and that's that's the biggest part. No, how many of you in the audience, and you don't have to raise your hand, there is no mechanism. How many of you in the audience have an incident response plan for yourself where you've written down what you're gonna do in a major incident from a cybersecurity perspective? Um, Matt, while, while saying that, correct me if I'm wrong, but if if I remember correctly, like control 18 within the CIS controls is a lot about that's, response. That's pen testing. 17 is response. 17, um, so, excuse me, 17. Yeah, no worries. It's okay, but good poke out. You were 100% right of where they were in that end of it. Right, um, but and I'll, also, I'll also point out that um, if I remember correctly, and again, I'm going off the top of my head here, but part of the implementation groups, right, as you get to IG2, IG3, Right, that's where you start to have a, a very solid response plan in place. But yeah. all of that is around maturity, right? And how mature you are. And it, and but, that brings us to the point that this is a journey, right? You can't just be secure. <laughs> Again, just be like done, secure, and solved, right? You yeah. have this maturation curve of that that follows some of that Dunning's Kruger challenge. Yeah, go so, ahead. So, Matt, let me do this. I want to change subjects a little bit. You kind of talked about this. I'm going to do another poll. This may totally break with with go to webinar, but I'm going to try it. Um, oh, I actually. Poll. I want you guys to utilize the chat or the questions. I really don't care which one you use, but I want to just get some some words from you guys around what you think the one thing that you wish vendors right, would do in order to help you with security. And this kind of comes from, I, I brought this question out because it comes from a conversation that Matt and I had uh, a week or two ago, which is, and you brought it up today, Matt. Um, which is how do we, um, what do we need to do better, right? We as a yeah. group, holistically, yeah. vendors, service providers, and even in customers yep. need to Here's uh, a great, great way us. to say this. Here's a great way to say this. I speak at 100-ish events a year, 100, 150 events a year um, in various forms or fashion. And when I talk about cybersecurity to MSPs and practitioners in general, they typically have two complaints. One. I wish my vendors would be better at cyber. I wish my vendors would be better at how uh, they secure themselves. I wish my vendors would be more secure in their releases. I wish my vendors would listen to security uh, practices better. So they have that thought. And then they have a second thought. And that second thought would be, I wish my clients would adopt MFA. I wish my clients would do the things I asked. I wish my clients would spend the money necessary for ever uh, for security. I wish my clients would have the, the passion for security and want to do it. I wish, wish my clients. 
how many of you go, hey, I wish my team would be more secure. And that's the challenge we're all facing. Every company and client you serve says, I wish my MSP would handle my security better. I wish my MSP was better. I wish my MSP was better. And you're saying, I wish my vendors were better, but nobody points that finger inwardly. And the same thing for vendors. They go, I wish my clients would use my stuff better. I wish my, right? I wish they would learn more about my tools before asking questions. I wish they were more uh, mature. I wish they would be better at their support handling. I wish they would, we all have that, but what we really, 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 really need to do, self-included, is look inwardly and say, how am I following these? And nobody does that. Go listen to your, next time you're sitting at a conference or listening to one of these, say, I, they're the ones that are the, that are the problem, but really there is an inward point and that goes away in some professions. If you go to an accountant, that doesn't exist. Why? They may hate their Thomson Reuters software. They may understand those things. And I'm being very specific. It's because they're professionals. They're known professionals. They had to get a license to be there. The worst attorney is proverbially above the bar and physically, right, in some ways, right? They are above the bar. We don't have that in our world. You can do this by going, yeah, man, I got a wrench. Let's put some wires together. Genuinely. <laughs> and and I, I think that's the challenge. So I think we do have a world that there's this shared responsibility failure that we need to deal with too, which is all of us upping our maturity, vendors getting better about how they follow their own maturity and invest in their own security for your responsibility and benefit. And in the same way, clients getting better at learning and those things. And in some ways, maybe we don't need to teach them. You said earlier, we have to get better at teaching. No, no, yeah. I found being prescriptive more effective than teaching. Oftentimes they look to me to be the expert. When I try to teach them, they get yeah. frustrated, lost. And sometimes I just need to say, no, I'm adding $3 to your bill a month and we're going to back up your email. If you want to talk about it. Call right, me. right. It's, inter it's interesting you say it that way because, and this is a challenge that, that I'm going to say we've had, right? Just being totally honest in the, the you know, network monitoring solution world, right? Educating people on why they need it is one thing, but also being prescriptive about why they need it, right? How it affects yeah. them is really important. I think security, security is a quintessential um, statement towards that right? because yeah. really what you're doing is you're protecting yourself, right? And that's where you as a service provider, think, oh, okay, I got the nose thing, right? You yeah. as a service provider need yeah. to fully understand that, yes, it can be about helping your customers, but if they don't know what it is, they don't really care anyway you need to be thinking about yourself and keeping your business alive. I mean, and Matt, you gave yeah. you know, your personal example about how shit went downhill very quickly because certain things weren't in place. And so I think yep. that that's so important. Um, I find it, by the way, I got the results of the poll. Two thirds of you guys want to plead the fifth. Totally. Yeah, good call. Right? Good call. Good yeah. Call. Third of uh, you though, smart. you know, you, you gave us some answers, right? And I'll just let you yeah. know what came across because I don't think you guys see these questions or these results, but, you know, honesty and truth, right? From the vendor, right? Being upfront about things. I, I agree with that, right? Um, I'll say from our own perspective, um, you know, being a SOC 2 type 2 compliant company, which is really around the process we implemented, there are things that we have to do in order to show responsibility. You know, if a breach does occur on, on our end, right, we have to respond in certain times. Same with the GDPR, right? Being being that we follow GDPR and a lot of the privacy laws that are out there, those are things that we have to do. I agree that vendors could do a better job with that. Um, I love Ben Humphrey's answer on, I wish vendors provided better training resources for the entire team. And I think that's a lot of um, one of the gaps, right? To your point, both for the client, yourself, and the vendors. Like, uh, there, there's just not enough education and, and the correct education, right? It doesn't have to be the, the, the 301, 401 version. This can be the 101 version for most people, but yeah. that, that education and training resources. And I think to your point, you're seeing a world bin shift from flashy marketing hype, selling things to thought leadership, empowerment and enablement that lets me make more money, drive things. And it goes back to JB, you know, Alyssa Miller's a famous CISO and she did a talk at Wild West Hackenfest um, la two years ago. And she said, we're told as CISOs our whole life, she's more mid-market enterprise, or I guess big enterprise, but we're told our whole life that the language of business is risk. And she said, no, that's BS. She actually used a different word for it. Um, but she said, the language of business is money and profit. It is raw, unadulterated profit. And it's the same thing. That's why we focus on us and our profit. You said it just a minute ago. We're yep. focused on our profit. They're focused on their profit. We have to find ways to educate how these impact profit. She went on to say, Risk also has already been taken on. The minute I start a business, I'm taking on almost all the risk I'm going to take on. So you're only selling to me the reduction of something I've already accepted. How valuable is that to me? 
And so you have some real challenges of this that are not all education. They are some degree strategy. You also said this earlier, strategy versus tactics versus operations. Let's make sure we're saying yep. the right words. Strategy is how am I going to fight this war? Am I going to fight this as a war of attrition? Am I going to fight this as a war of strategically taking out these, these things that stop the war effort on the other side? Or what am I going to do? Tactics or tactical is really now, now that I've decided what strategy, kill more bodies, kill different things, you know, take out different things. Then now I can say, okay, I need to take that hill. I need to blow up this munitions depot. I need to take out these. Those are tactics. Operations is and bop, 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 right? Like that's the yeah. operational arm of this. And so when we right. talk about this, this strategy thinking when it comes to those partners and, and vendors, um, we need to be sure that we're focusing on the things that don't require them to know the subject matter depth, but help them understand the seriousness and where they're going from a business perspective. But again, translating that to profit where possible. Like look at Starbucks, for example, they put in FIDO tokens, right? Um, these these guys, they put in FIDO tokens as their sign-in methodology for a lot of the baristas and different people in their employment. And the guy said, I didn't win the argument simply on uh, how much uh, it would save in security because these are much less easy to be uh, attacked as an attack surface. Um, and, and he said, I won on just the fact that a barista could walk up, put in a PIN number and absolutely sign in and sell coffee securely 15 seconds faster than typing in a password and then using a push notification. That's how I won. And that's profit, not security, even though the security underpinnings were there. Anyways, um, side tangent aside, but no, great no, comment no. so far. It, the support and the education there, I think, is is so important. In fact, Jason brought up uh, nsitsp.org. Yeah, yeah. Right. Carl Palachuk and Amy Babin, Babichuk. Yeah, and all exactly. That. Great, great group, right, that started, yeah, I want to say they started a year and a half ago. Maybe no, two it's years. been about almost three now is my gut, three? something like that. Maybe three. No, no, there's this whole COVID yeah. thing in between. I don't know. Yeah, right? it did kind of pause our collective consciousness for a bit. Didn't yeah, it? but I, I, I love what they're doing, right? And I, Dude, I think- true story, Jason Harrison down here. Most SMB customers are not aware of all the risks they've taken on. Bro, preach it. That's exactly the challenge. They don't know what they've accepted. That's the difference in an enterprise versus a, a small to mid-sized business. I think that's a well, true. well said, Jerryson. And in fact, I'm not even going to bother with the last poll, which was, what do you think, uh, you know, your your customers, right, your end customers need to do to help you with security? Because I don't know. You know I like the I like the idea of the answer, JB. I want to see what people think about it. I'm still down with that. Two years. Thanks. Well, I'll throw it out there. Let's throw it out there. Let's let's just do yeah, it quickly. We only so, have a minute left. I know. I'm same, I'm ruining same, this here. Same concept, guys. Right? Tell me what you think. Right. That your, your comments. comments. We'll see them as they pop in. We'll just we'll just read them off. Right. What are your customers? How can they help you? Yeah, yeah. So, so put that in the 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 questions okay. panel again. I don't. And if we don't get much, we'll close it out. We're late on the on the thing, so yeah, I apologize. Yeah. But so, um, and it's okay if you guys think that uh, you know I'll call you out. Whatever. Jeez, I won't. But um, Matt, with the, while that's coming up, right? Because I think yeah. we've talked about this, and and you you said this uh, quite poignantly which is I think we all need to be thinking about what we need to do, right? I'm a vendor, you're a vendor, right? Service provider, you've been a service provider. They need yeah. to be thinking about what they're doing. I also believe that the end customers need to get some awareness around this, even to Jason's point, right? They communication. don't yeah. know yeah. what they don't know, right? And education. Amen, Brian. Baby steps at a minimum to take action and recognize the importance. <sighs> yep. Yeah. Actually care about security. Yeah, Joseph, some of that's on us, right? In, in some ways, that's us to build that culture. But yeah, great. Fantastic good. answers. Keep them coming. They're good. Um, um, I don't know. I mean, while those are coming in. <laughs> Josh, stop asking for steps in MFA every time it inconveniences someone. Exactly. Josh, I've lived yeah. it. Uh, <laughs> we do need to get them to care about security. Well, I know... I know we're we're really out of time. Um, you already touched on what you are doing from a community perspective. I love yeah, the really. fact that Tax Aid is embracing this and helping you do this, right? Creating more of a community effort. I want to give a shout out there to them uh, because it takes a lot to to say, hey, we think that this is better for the greater good of the whole community and not just focus it on themselves and the profit. So the fact that they're yeah. enabling you to get on this platform and speak to all this, I, I think is wonderful. And it's exactly why I wanted to bring you on board here. Um, yeah. You know, the money side will work itself out from the vendor perspective and the service provider, as long as we get educated and understand how we can strategically leverage this. Uh, to your point about what are the tactics that I need to implement in order to, to meet that strategic goal and how do we make it operational, right? How do we implement yep. it? 
So and I, how do I, we profit from it, right? Let's not miss that. How do we profit from it? We're all here to make profit. Yep. Uh, so yeah, absolutely. Beautiful. Matt, thank you so much for your time. We'll fight the good fight, boys and girls out there. And thank you for having me, JB. I appreciate you. Yeah, thank you. You guys have a great afternoon or evening, depending on where you're listening to this. And we look forward to chatting with you guys on the next MSP Blast Off. So talk to you later. Thank you. Good seeing you.